Big Oil did not pay. Before the talk begins in this video, please have a look to some pictures of our former people and some of the facilities that we installed. I hope that you will enjoy the music. Day. My name is Werner Schweppes, I'm the issuer of this video documentation. This video was created to remember our project team and work on one very large lump sum turnkey project in the Middle East, to which I was later assigned as project manager. Before moving to the construction site, I was stationed at the Floor Daniel Engineering Office in Houston, Texas, overseeing engineering and procurement activities for the project from November 1989 onwards. I want to mention that the project was the most technically and commercially complex challenge of my entire life. The video features the facilities that were built by us for the largest oil producer in the Middle East, from November 1989 to June 1993. The chart below illustrates the oil production of our client during this period. It is noteworthy that there was a significant increase in production from 5.5 to 8.5 million barrels of crude oil per day when the Gulf War began. This increase one can say was double because the price of oil increased drastically as well. The average monthly price of oil rose from 17 US dollar per barrel in July to 36 US dollar per barrel in October 1990. Despite the first Gulf War that took place from August 1990 to February 1991, our client refused to grant force major or extend the project's contractual completion time. How you as a contractor can adhere to a project completion date during a war.
they insisted that it was business as usual, even though the country's Chamber of Commerce and Industry had acknowledged a force majeure situation in their publication dated on 5 February 1991. This decision had a significant negative impact on our work, leading to financial losses. The contract was signed on 4 October 1989. The project kickoff meeting took place at the Mansman office in Dusseldorf, where the project team met with a client. Floor Daniel in Houston, Texas, provided engineering work for the project, and Mansman conducted procurement activities in Houston. The project involved modifying and building 11 crude oil pump stations, six surge relief stations, and upgrading two existing oil production facilities to double the pipeline system's throughput capacity from 2.5 million to 5 million barrels of crude oil per day. The project had a total power capacity of around 600 megawatts that we installed to drive the pumps at those 11 pump stations. A week after the project kickoff meeting was held in Dusseldorf, a team of Mansman engineers for each engineering discipline including procurement personnel went to the Floor Daniel office in Houston to oversee engineering work and carry out procurement activities for the project. Shortly after this, my boss Horst Schrager ordered me to go to Houston as well and manage the ongoing project activities as a contractor's representative from there. On a personal note, I have to say that this order surprised me a lot because I was deeply involved with Occidental Petroleum and Consolidated Contractors Company in another offer namely the Rumela oil field in Iraq at this time. Nevertheless, I got a new challenging job. By the 1st of November 1989, I started my new assignment in Houston, and it was for a long time. Wolfgang Elmer the project manager went we meet to Houston and introduced me to our client and to Floor Daniel as contractor's representative having full signature power for the project. Our team in Houston consisted of more than 20 mansman people. Within this team were Jasser Parkel, Eberhard Rishi, Thomas Widenbrich and Klaus Mieseler as procurement manager included. Later for contractual matters, Stuart Ness and George Scroff joined us. Most of these people were later stationed in the Middle East on the construction site. At the end of 1991, my boss urged me to join a group in the Middle East as the project manager. However, eight months earlier, I had declined the position as my claim preparation work in Houston was not yet finished. Moreover, I did not wish to replace my colleague, Wolfgang Elmer, who was the current project manager at that time. Nonetheless, even before becoming the project manager, I visited the construction site numerous times to provide guidance on specific matters and attend meetings with our client. These visits enabled me to be fully informed about the construction work's ongoing situation. Later on, my boss, Horst Schrager, expressed his dissatisfaction with me, complaining that I had declined the position of project manager and delayed my assignment by eight months. My friend Elmer Peach was also working on the construction to help with resolving some problems. But he intended to leave. After I took over as project manager, I had a conversation with him and agreed to release him from the project. He then went on to pursue his desired job as a regional manager for Mansman and Lejenbao in Asia, stationed in Singapore. Another very experienced pipeline project manager, Hans Hesmert, who had also assisted with managing the challenging construction work, was also able to go home at the time after I took over the project. The project scope of the Middle East Increased Capacity Pipeline System project included engineering, procurement, construction, demothballing, upgrading, and tie-in works of all mechanical, electrical, and control systems. This video documentation provides some impressive pictures and explains some of the work that was performed for this project. It was a very complex project with many challenges with respect to technical and commercial matters. During the peak time of the project, 4,600 people were employed to design and build the facilities. 20 individual construction sites were running in parallel and located over a distance of 1,250 kilometers. The project was completed in May 1993, which means the entire project duration until the project was fully operational was three and a half years. The client requested that we speed up our construction activities by September 1992. However, we were not completely reimbursed for the extra resources we needed to mobilize or for the overtime, we worked to meet this deadline. Additionally, we were not compensated for the economic dislocation caused by the war. The initial completion date was December 1992, but due to the Gulf War outbreak, work was disrupted for six months. I will delve into this matter in the change orders and claims section of this video. The full compliance by the entire project workforce to the Mansman and Lejenbau Quality Assurance, Safety Manual, and all the client standards has led the project to excellent work quality and safety records. 
Today after more than 30 years those facilities are still under operation. During the performance test conducted by the owner and assisted by us on the 16th of May 1993, after the project completion, more than 5 million barrels of crude oil were pumped in one day. With this test achievement, the system requirement was even better as specified and therefore fulfilled. Now I will tell you what major equipment and systems were installed on the project. 22 new combustion gas turbines pump trains 35,000 horsepower each. Combustion gas turbine maintenance workshop. Retrofit works of 33 FT4 drivers and pumps at crude oil pump stations. Retrofit works of 20 existing drivers and pumps at crude oil production facilities. 13 booster pumps 3,100 horsepower each. 1.25 million barrels crude oil tank with floating roof. 6 surge relief facilities including surge relief tanks, 20,000 barrels each. 11 NGL fuel vaporization systems for the CGTs. 13 computerized metering systems for NGL and crude oil flow measuring. 2 computerized burner management systems for steam boilers. 10 new blast proof control buildings and upgrading of 5 existing control buildings. 17 buildings, 2 substation, 4 switchgear and 11 motor control center. 16 distributed control systems, DCS, and connected to an upgraded SCADA. 47 transformers, 18 switchgears, 22 bus ducts, and 28 motor control centers. 25 kilometers of 56-inch pipeline loop, including launcher and receiver stations. 18 cathodic protection systems. At all 11 pump stations, the two new pumps were placed to the east of the three existing pumps. The piping design was based on a minimum separation of 30 meters between the center lines of pumps. The two new pumps were dedicated to taking suction from the 56-inch pipeline only. To connect the two new pumps and provide access for maintenance, the existing 48-inch suction header piping for the 56-inch pipeline was replaced. A clear space of 2 meters between the suction and discharge lines was maintained, allowing sufficient personnel access between the piping loops of the adjacent pump trains. The new discharge header from the added pumps was tied in with the existing discharge header. Additionally, the old road between the existing and new pump train was shortened to allow routing of the new suction and discharge headers above ground. To allow recirculation, a 20-inch pipe system was installed between the mainline pump discharge and suction lines. Double block and bleed valves were used to loop the 56-inch and 48-inch pipelines for each pump station, except pump station 3, where one jump over existed. To enable these pipe works, it was necessary to use hot tap connections. Two 42-inch jump-overs were installed, one upstream and one downstream of each pump station. Modification and installations works on Plants 1 and 2 from 1990 until May 1993. Plant 1 is the originating pump station for the 1,200 km long pipeline system. The project installed and modified the necessary facilities so that 3,080 million barrel per day of light crude oil, via the existing plant pump stations 4 and 6, could be shipped through the 56-inch pipeline. In addition, modifications were made in order to transport more than 1,700,000 barrel of heavy crude oil per day that was received from plant 2 to plant 1 through the existing 48-inch pipeline. For this shipment of heavy crude oil, four new electric motor-driven booster pumps were purchased and installed at plant 1, including the associated isolation valves, check valves, minimum flow recycle, and pressure control valves. We purchased new Venturi meters replaced with those Venturi meters the existing metering skid and relocated it to PS1. The existing stabilizer 4 to 11 columns needed to be demothballed and an area sump pump was installed. We purchased and installed 9 replacement impellers for the existing Byringe Axon shipping pumps, including new vibration and temperature monitoring systems for those pumps at both plants. We installed a new burner management system, BMS, into two existing plant boilers. A new back pressure controller was added to the discharge lines in two plant one pump station discharge pipes. These controls would relieve when high pressure conditions exist in the 48-inch pipeline. In production plant two where the heavy crude oil was coming from, we replaced the pump impellers and the associated piping connected to those pumps and refurbished the foundations. The civil work conducted on the project included site preparations, pouring foundations, grading and concrete paving, new roads accessways, site drainage systems, different kind of buildings including electrical substations, blast-proof control rooms, HVAC installations, utilities, site fencing and fire protection systems. 
Now I will tell you the summary of the project engineering deliverables, the major quantities of materials installed, and some of the major work quantities with respect to welding, concrete pouring, and hot taps. The number of as-built drawings was 24,832 of which each was approved by the client. 34,244 engineering documents issued, a detailed breakdown included in this video. 20,000 tons of station piping and fittings installed. 10,000 tons of various valves erected. 12,437 instruments installed and loop checked. 1,975,000 meters of power, control, and instrumentation cables installed. 1,680,000 meters of conduits laid. 50,000 cubic meters concrete poured, all rebars have been fusion bonded epoxy coated. 600,000 diameter inch station piping welded. 330 numbers of small instrument hot taps drilled. 57 numbers of major hot taps 31 through 56 drilled. As I said before for the project engineering work, Mans Arabia subcontracted Floor Daniel in Houston, Texas, USA. The subcontract work commenced in October 1989 at Floor's office in Houston and was completed by March 1992. Floor Daniel reported that they had 450 individuals involved in the job at the peak of their work. The engineering disciplines included civil, electrical, instrument, mechanical, piping, and structural engineering, as well as advanced hydraulic pipeline simulations. It's worth noting that computer capacities of that time were far less powerful than today's. Some hydraulic simulations took an astonishing 24 hours to run. Our client had around 40 engineers including their project manager and sometimes a senior project manager in Floor's office. We had weekly meetings with our client. Those meetings were conducted separately for plants and pumping stations. Overlapping issues between plants and pumping stations were discussed in joint meetings. In addition to those meetings, squad checks on drawings before those drawings were finally issued for construction were held frequently. Before I begin discussing my experience with Floor Daniels Engineering, I want to mention that when I arrived at their office, there was a small group of mansmen hired people led by Bob Drago working there. These individuals were focused on construction planning, including plant shutdown scenarios, and had already completed level 4 planning for some of the work. Based on my understanding of the project, I intended to focus more on engineering and procurement to ensure those two activities were running correctly, and then follow up with construction planning, with a slight timely offset. After about two weeks, I began implementing my approach, and the scheduling activity eventually slowed down somewhat. Shortly after that, Bob Drago left the project. All the planning including progress reporting was then was taken over by Thomas Wittenberg and Peter Moss. Floor Daniel issued a total of 34,244 drawings during the construction of the project, all of which were approved by the client. To manage these documents, a complex engineering and drawing progress report, EDPR, was used to track the drawing number and all other relevant information. Since the EDPR was also used as a payment tool, it was crucial in monitoring the engineering progress. However, after six months into the project, it was discovered by us that Floor Daniel had overreported their progress by around 15%. This issue was significant as it led to an audit to determine the actual progress of the project. The audit confirmed the overreporting and the relationship between Floor Daniel and us became quite nasty. The trust was completely gone, and Floor Daniel initiated some team building courses. However, those team building efforts were worth nothing and failed. An example of how the EDPR is shown is provided here. As can be seen on the project engineering deliverable table, Floor Daniel was also responsible for preparing the requisitions for our procurement. In total 209 requisitions were issued by them. As mansmen, we were responsible for procuring all equipment and materials for the project under the owner's requirements, except for two major items, namely 22 RB211 CGT pump trains and the entire pump station distribution control system that our client procured by himself. It's worth noting that the client's design basis for the pump stations was based on General Electric Turbine's LM2500, not Rolls-Royce RB211s. After Floor Daniel began engineering work and received technical information from the vendor, we discovered that the manufacturer, Rolls-Royce, did not provide any interconnecting supplies for the pump train supporting auxiliary equipment. The delivery of the RB211 pump train did not include any piping spools or cables. In addition, Rolls-Royce made it clear that they would not install the pump train or provide first filler vendor representatives. This was unexpected, as the pump train was supposed to be a modular package. 
The news came as a shock to us, like being hit with a sledgehammer. This posed a significant problem for us, since we had a contractual understanding that all these materials would be included with the delivery, and all we needed to do was to connect the mainline pump with the suction and discharge piping, and may assist Rolls-Royce with our cranes and workers during the installation of their modular pump train package. During a quarterly project status meeting in the Middle East with our client's top management, my boss Horst Schrager, may he rest in peace, confirmed our understanding that we would take the RB211 main pump train unit and place it on the foundation. As well we will connect the suction and discharge piping to the main pumps. This goes already beyond our contractual obligations. However, our client expressed dissatisfaction with this statement. Why? The answer is very simple. Money. From that point forward, this particular topic became a highly debated issue. Subsequently, on the same day early in the morning, the client's project manager came to me into my office at Floor Daniels. He wanted me to speak to my boss, Horst Schrager, about the statement he had made eight hours before at the quarterly project review meeting regarding our work scope understanding in relation to the installation of the RB211 pump train. I told him that Schrager's understanding of our work scope was correct and it would be pointless to speak to him about it because he would not change his statement that he has made to your top management. To give you an idea of the assembly and erection process of the 22 CGT pump trains, let me provide you with a brief description. The assembly and installation of one CGT pump train on-site involved 121 working steps, taking us 27,424 working hours to complete. It was like assembling a complex model kit. The overall dimensions of the installed gas turbine pump train plot plan were 23.7 meters in length, 22.5 meters in width, and had an exhaust stack height of 11.3 meters, with a total weight of 200 tons. The entire installation process for all 22 pump trains took us a total of 603,328 hours, which highlights the sheer amount of additional work we had to put in. But it didn't end there. We also had to bear the cost of interconnecting piping engineering, materials, installation, and subsequent chemical cleaning of those interconnecting auxiliary pipes. Moreover, our client insisted that we would procure the first fills and vendor representative for those RB211 pump trains. Despite various other problems with Floor Daniel, they had the same contractual understanding as we had, and they considered the detailed design for those interconnections, not their work scope. The other challenge was the station distributed control system. It was called a state-of-the-art control and data gathering system of proven technology and short SDCS. The piping and instrumentation diagrams from our client design basis especially for the existing facilities did not include all the station's control requirements for this system. Here, the use of the so-called new smart instruments was one important issue. One should notice here that the cable requirements were different from the old common analog instruments. The challenge here was that at the 11 pump stations, we had a total of 12,437 instrument loops. All the control cables needed to be connected in terminations marshalling boxes via PLCs and a data highway to the SDCS computer. This huge number of 12,437 instrument loops is telling you what interfaces we had with a new automized control system supplied by Texas Instrument. All the necessary coordination between the Floor Daniel engineering team, Rolls-Royce, and Texas Instrument was not easy. It looked like that some of the participants did not have a great interest in resolving those matters, because many times the argument this is not a part of our work scope was used. As it can be understood from this statement the main issue on those deliveries was the contract by itself, with a different understanding of our client and us, with respect to the battery limits of our work scope. And here was the problem for us. We mansmen as general contractor were stuck in the middle, and we had to overcome the difficulties. Due to the unclear battery limits in the work scope on the RB211 CGT pump train, including the complexity of all the vendor information the engineering slowed somewhat down. Another issue we faced was the centralized NGL fuel vaporization system specified by our client in the contract. For your understanding, the vaporized NGL fuel was used for operating all 55 combustion engines of the mainline pumps and generators at the pump stations. Due to its questionable operational reliability, we had extensive discussions with the client and subsequently, they issued change orders number 3 and number 4 to remove the centralized NGL vaporization system. As a result, we designed and built an alternative system using individual vaporizers for each combustion gas turbine, generators, and a different flare system at all the pump stations. 
it was no surprise that this major change caused additional disruption and some further delays for us due to many design changes from the basic design provided by our client. Dealing with Floor Daniel could sometimes be a strange situation. On one hand, they would say that a certain task was not part of their work scope and refuse to do it. On the other hand, if it was easy for them, they would implement a change in the drawings if the client requested it. With the huge number of documents that were issued for the project, our Mansman engineering team had to look carefully into this situation, which was not easy. Our client had I would say hundreds of different company standards, some of which were not included in our contract. Nevertheless, the client engineering team at Floor Daniel aimed to integrate all of their standard requirements into the design, regardless of whether they were part of our contract or not. While they had the right to include anything they wanted in the design, any addition should have been accompanied by a change order and payment for those changes. One such issue was the presence of some dead legs in the pump station's piping system. Although there was a client standard that specified what to do with dead legs, it was not part of our contract. However, our client requested Floor Daniel to include those standard requirements in the construction drawings. We detected this, and after significant discussion, change order numbers 87 and 167 were issued for the disputed item. The combined value of these two change orders on dead legs was $825,000. I had many fights on such issues with Floor Daniel and our client. Our subcontract that we had with Floor was not clear on such issues, and the entire situation became quite nasty. To say it open our subcontract that we had with Floor Daniel was very weak. The feedback on this issue that I received back from Dusseldorf from the person who negotiated the subcontract was useless and apologetic. Regarding those disputes, things had escalated to the point where our client wanted to remove me from the project. However, this did not happen because some of the client people supported me. I knew these individuals from my brief stint in the Middle East beginning of 1986, when I was overseeing as spread boss the construction of a 56-inch oil pipeline. The complexity of the issues I faced in the Floor Daniels engineering office was not fully understood by most people. However, my boss Horst Schrager understood this complexity and the problematic. I convinced my boss to arrange a meeting with our client's higher management in the Middle East to establish clear guidelines for what constituted a change in the contract. Besides Horst Schrager, Hans Hesmert, Wolfgang Elmer and I participated in the meeting, and we agreed that any addition or deletion to process flow diagrams Piping and instrumentation diagrams. Electrical one-line diagrams. Plot plans. Area classification drawings. Would require a change order. However, this agreement sometimes later proved to be insufficient, and problems with the work scope persisted, particularly with the interconnecting piping and cabling. Shortly after the meeting, the area manager who had agreed with us retired due to his age which was not good because this man had fair behavior towards a contractor. His deputy, later successor, instructed us to proceed with the design and procurement of all interconnecting piping and cables, insisting that all the work scopes under dispute were ours, including first fill and vendor representatives. This instruction has cost us around 30 million US dollars, and later our client did not pay for it. I initially refused to do it but, after a lengthy discussion with our contract experts, they convinced me that we had to do it. Subsequently, we issued initially change order request number 140, with the title changed method of CGT pump train system delivery. Later in 1992, the entire disputed matter on the RB211 pump train became the issue of two claims. I have a small anecdote to share with you. A friend who worked as a senior engineer for our client's group revealed to me about the senior project manager who was part-time stationed in the Floor Daniel office. When he talked about us, he referred to Mansman and said, it would be better for Mansman to be in the bank robbery business than to try to steal the money from his oil company. Such a statement reveals the kind of man we were dealing with at the client's end. It is evident that if somebody was a thief, it was not us. Our client should have looked at themselves instead. However. I must say, there were also some good and fair people who worked at our client's company. Floor Daniel, with decades of experience in executing complex projects, had problems achieving the scheduled progress of the engineering deliverables as planned. This delay impacted our procurement and initial civil construction concerning underground cable ducts because of missing conduits. They did not issue the necessary requisitions for material procurement due to some missing client vendor information. This put us in an awkward position, but we managed to force Floor Daniel to provide us with preliminary requisitions to start the procurement. We requested our vendors to be flexible in case of changes to the purchase order. 
All major purchase orders were placed by September 1991 by us. The summer eyes we suffered some delays, and then the Gulf War started in August 1990. This war caused many negative disruptive impacts on the project and prevented us from even more to be able to adhering to the contract schedule. During the construction of production plant 1 for the booster shipping pumps and in some other areas, our construction engineers received the first drawings issued for construction. However, while carrying out excavation work, we discovered several old abandoned piping systems in the ground. Due to safety reasons, the obstacles could not be removed which resulted in the suspension of our construction work. As a result, valuable time was lost. The basic design information provided as part of our contract did not reflect in many cases the real as built situation of the existing crude oil production plant 1 and some pump stations. To overcome this situation our client issued change order number 5, which was called Production Plant 1 Task Force. The fact that this change order was issued demonstrates that the basic design provided by our client, especially for production plant 1, contained numerous errors. Afterwards, we organized a thorough on-site visit to examine the actual facilities and pump stations so that accurate drawings could be issued to reflect the real as-built conditions. Unfortunately, this visit of a team of Flora Daniel engineers was supposed to take place exactly when the Gulf War started, so it was delayed and our site construction activities got even more delayed. Nevertheless, for our client the Gulf War was business as usual, even though missiles were flying through the air in their own country. The project was significantly impacted by the first Gulf War, which began on 2 August 1990 when Iraq invaded Kuwait. After defeating Kuwait on 4 August 1990, Iraq occupied the country for seven months. Many people feared that Iraq would not stop at Kuwait and would continue south to acquire the vast oil reserves from our client located in the neighboring county. At this time, we had already begun civil works at the pump stations and production plant 1. However, following the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, prices for shipments to the Middle East increased drastically. It became very difficult to book shippers for the project equipment and materials to be installed on our construction site. During the mobilization of the International Desert Storm Coalition, which consisted of 750,000 personnel and a significant amount of equipment and vehicles, almost all international shippers were occupied. This resulted in a shortage of transportation services, catering, and accommodations, making everything rare and more expensive. Additionally, local civil work constructors were hired by the coalition forces, leaving us without their work services. All prices including the price of oil skyrocketed. Furthermore, foreign laborers left the areas of the Middle East. Those people were going back to their home countries. Finding people to do our construction work was very challenging. In reality, no one wanted to work in this area due to the fear that Scud missiles carrying poison gas would fly in. We always carried gas masks with us, and even the windows in our clients and in all other offices, houses, and apartments were sealed with tape in order to have protection against a poison gas attack. Most of the airlines stopped flying, and getting a flight to the Middle East was extremely difficult after British Airways Flight 149 was taken hostage in Kuwait by Iraqi troops after the plane landed. Later the plane 747 was destroyed. I managed to get my flights via Bahrain with airlines of which I had never heard the name, and it was not a pleasant experience, being at high altitude while deadly missiles were flying around outside. The International Desert Storm Coalition's air campaign over Kuwait and Iraq began on 17 January 1991. Heavy smoke from burning oil fields in Kuwait reached our working area, and the air was very polluted. The Battle of Kafji began on 29 January 1991 and lasted until 1 February 1991. Here one of our client's refineries was hit by a missile and was on fire. Kafji was 350 kilometers away from Plant 1, and Scud missiles were fired by Iraqi forces in the direction of Plant 1, but fortunately, they were intercepted by Patriot missiles. Everybody from us could say that we were very lucky. The barracks warehouse not too far away from Plant 1 and our construction camp was hit by an Iraqi Scud missile on the evening of 25 February 1991, used to house U.S. Army soldiers assigned to the 475th Quartermaster Group. As a consequence of this Scud attack, 28 soldiers I have to repeat again that our client insisted that it was business as usual, but this was in reality not the case. The ground war officially ended with the signing of the armistice on the 11th of April 1991, after seven months of fighting, causing a lot of deaths, harm to people, and many economic dislocations including our project.
As of late 1991, I took on the role of project manager and was immediately confronted with a severe financial crisis within the project. The cost report indicated a discrepancy of roughly 23 million US dollars in costs, with a significant portion of the unreported costs originating from various activities, including procurement. This implied that the figures used by our accountants were not up to date with the latest real numbers. It was frustrating to rely on a cost report that was not reliable. The incorrect cost reporting had significant repercussions for the project's financial situation and required me to take drastic measures to clean up the project. We had to reassess our approach to our claims concerning the war's impact since the cost situation differed significantly from the previous cost report. My boss, Horst Schrager, instructed me to analyze everything and brainstorm ways for the project to generate additional revenue and turn a profit. My first two actions as project manager were to remove one commercial manager and subsequently, his successor who only lasted four days. I did not see the need to have commercial managers when the project's cost report was not accurate. Instead, I assigned our accountants Dieter Schindler and Oscar Biavidi to carry out this job, and they were already making progress in addressing the correct cost situation of the project. Secondly, I had to terminate a significant number of expatriates who were employed during the construction phase of the project. This was necessary to save money and had no impact on the progress of the project. These terminations have been overdue for some time already. Regarding our claims, I think that our top management made a crucial error by not insisting on fair payments from our client at an earlier stage. Due to their lenient approach, the project progressed without any payments being made towards our legitimate claims. Our client did not show any willingness to deal with us, the contractor, in a fair manner which I believe was just money savings from their site. To reiterate, there is an ongoing shooting war, yet our client insists that there is business as usual. It's almost unbelievable. Our local sponsor, Sheikh Khalid Ali Al Turkey, was the driving force behind the gentle approach towards our client. When there was a need to send a strong letter to our client's top management, such a letter was studied for two days and altered so much until it became soft. This was a big mistake from my point of view. I have to say here that Sheikh Khalid Ali Al Turkey had a big interest in our financial situation becoming positive as well, because his construction company Agap was working for us on the project, and reasonable compensation to his Agap company could only happen if we were successful with our claim compensation by our client. We missed a great opportunity to put pressure on the client when the project was around 70% complete. We should have stopped working at that time and looked up all the materials. Unfortunately, we lack the courage to take such a bold step. Our client was very tough with us and did not even give force major, despite a war in the region where we were working and was playing hardball with us. So, we should have played hardball with them as well, but we missed the opportunity. At 70% project completion, I pushed for a hard-nosed approach, which was still possible at such a completion percentage. However, it was too late at 90% project completion, and we had to finish the project as quickly as possible, with a minimum of cost. At this stage of 90% completion, you have to keep your client happy so that he will not overrun you with punch list items and warranty issues later on. I wanted to share with you an quite important event that occurred in December 1992. Prinz Wikenstein, a board member of Mansman AG, visited some of our clients' board members. They flew together in a small private jet to visit all 20 construction sites. During the visit, Prinz Wikenstein discussed future business plans with our client and also received the confirmation that we would receive a fair settlement for our claims. This confirmation gave me a lot of confidence that we would indeed receive a fair settlement. Now I coming to the project change orders and claims. As I already told you before throughout the project, some errors in the design basis were rectified, and a total number of 171 change orders were issued by our client. Most of these change orders were for work modifications, additions, and a few deletions to the contract work and schedule, with respect to plant shutdowns. However, payment for these changes was slow, which worsened our cash flow problem, already impacted by the war, due to the construction progress slowdown. It is important to note that we financed a significant part of this project with Mansman money, and this was for one of the biggest oil producers in the world. We financed the engineering, procurement, and construction required for all the change order work. Our cash flow problem was not only due to the war, but also due to the slow payment by our client. The situation became so bad that a contract interpretation was required to determine the meaning of the contract words prompt payments. It was decided that prompt payment means that payments should be made within six weeks of receiving an undisputed invoice. 
it is important to note that despite the very slow payments, we continuously pushed the project forward without any interruptions, even in the midst of a war. However, instead of being appreciated for our efforts, we were met with criticism, and we were not fully paid. During the course of the project, various disputes emerged, which I mentioned in my video. Consequently, we identified significant claims that amounted to over 100 million United States dollars in value. Our team meticulously scrutinized all elements of the claims, including cost, damage assessment, delay analysis, loss of labor productivity analysis, and more. We approached the analysis objectively, following these steps. 1. Analyzation of the contractual documents and validation of the legitimacy of the claim. 2. Review of the project documents, schedules, change orders, drawings, correspondence, etc. 3. Identifications of all problems encountered during the construction. 4. Conducted a detailed delay analysis based on each element of the schedule and drawing changes. 5. Preparation of crew cost sheets, tables, and graphs resulting from the impact of changes on the project. 6. A structured priced claim document was developed and issued to our client by us. The claims included on the following list had a value of around 100 million United States dollars. 1. Additional instruments loops. 2. Changed method of CGT mainline pump train delivery. 3. Construction acceleration pump stations. 4. Plant 1 resequencing of construction work. 5. CGT pump train, piping, cable and anchor bolts only. 6. Concrete encasement of cable conduits. 7. Engineering delay and disruption. 8. Procurement acceleration. 9. Economic dislocation. I can confirm that our claim estimates were accurate. However, during a discussion, Mr. Kunzi, our commercial director, criticized me for setting the claim values too high. I explained to him that the numbers were based on accurate calculations and reflected the values that could be obtained from our client. The real challenge lies in determining whether the claimed work and the circumstances, such as the economic dislocation due to the war, fall within or outside the scope of our work. Additionally, obtaining additional funds during the project requires the goodwill of the client's top management. Towards the end of 1992, the client's claim review panel finalized its estimates with respect to our legitimate claims and advised their board about the compensation that it would be due to us. Our understanding was that the settlement amount would be an amount of around 70 million United States dollars. However, during a board meeting, the president of our client oil company did not agree with the amount suggested by the claim review panel and reduced it to around 27 million US dollars on his own. The decision to grant us a low claim compensation was purely political and not based on the legitimacy of our claim submissions. Although I did not like the man responsible for this decision due to his harmful conduct towards us, it was ultimately based on a government policy. The shock of the low compensation amount was felt by all of us, and we found it hard to believe. Despite my personal feelings, the decision to accept the offer or go to a legal battle was in the hands of the Mansman board. It was deemed imprudent to engage in a legal battle for the low compensation amount, which was for sure a political number. I traveled to Dusseldorf and met with Horst Schrager and a member of the board where we discussed stopping all project activities. Everyone was upset about the US$27 million United States dollars claim compensation. We agreed to meet again the next day. The following day, I suggested that I return to the Middle East and complete the project as fast as possible. The management agreed, and we accepted the offer. This meant that Mansman Corporation could continue to do business with the client. With this acceptance, Mansman paid its part for the Gulf War to a country that is one of the largest oil producers in the world. Let me tell you here as well that I believe if we would have been a United States-based contractor, our client would not have been so unfair with this claim settlement. But with being a German-based contractor our client could do it and they acted very unfairly since we became 27 cents for one dollar of our claims presented. It is worth noting that the president of our client's oil company later became the oil minister of his country and was well known for his OPEC cartel meetings. He made frequent appearances on CNBC television shows and was referred to as Mr. Crude Oil of the Middle East. Whenever I saw him on CNBC, it made me very angry and I was relieved when he was dismissed from his position. This unfair payment of our claims I will never forget in my life. It should be noted that nobody was fired from us due to the poor results of this project. The Board of Mansman Cooperation understood the situation and recognized that the main negative impact on the project was due to the Gulf War, which our client did not acknowledge as a force major event. 
Here are all the important dates for the project summarized. Contract Award. October 1989. Mechanical Completion. Several steps for each individual facility starting in October 1992. Contract Completion. Successfully passed site acceptance test of 5 million barrels of crude oil, pumped on 16 May 1993. The final invoice after the project guarantee was submitted on 16 May 1994 to our client. The final project release agreement was signed on 10 August 1994, and all bank and parent guarantees were returned to us. The original contract value was US$343,000,000, but the final contract value was US$398,000,000. Our final total cost was US$430,000,000, meaning our project lost around US$32,000,000. It was a big shame after all the hard work that we had done under all the difficult circumstances, including a war as explained before. I personally stayed on the job in the Middle East until the project guarantee time expired. Our retention money and all bonds were returned to us in August 1994. In this video, you will find some additional technical images towards the end. If I had included all the technical sections with descriptions, it would have made the video longer than 3 hours, which might not keep the viewers engaged. Therefore, I have included some of our technical images only to give you a glimpse to remember our work performed. Making this video was not an easy task, especially for me as I am a 72-year-old man. Yet, my memories are still bright, and the video is an accurate representation of the events that took place over 30 years ago. I hate wars. Werner Schweppes. little tour of my office in Saudi Arabia. This is Werner Schweppes, project manager, sometimes cook, but you will see that later. As you can see, his office is very, very important with lots of charts and things on the wall and some pictures and other nice things. And we'll move on now to somebody else. So, this is Moan. He sometimes answers the phone when you call. Maybe you can understand him, maybe you can't. He's our master typist, telephonist, but mostly he sleeps and eats during the course of the day. George, are you recording this call? Of course I am. Oh, <laughs> sometimes he's bashful, but sometimes not. But we'll just keep embarrassing him a little bit longer, shall we? 
And here, of course, we have Anthony, Master Faxman, also sometimes answering of phones. He's responsible for keeping all our paper in order and other things. What a nice guy. So, here we have Mr. June Fellowen, computer expert extraordinaire. He's the man who's responsible for sending us all these nice discs that sometimes work, sometimes don't work. <laughs> Problem is, he can sort them out in Saudi Arabia, but not in England or Germany. His colleague sits over, but we've sent him out onto the pump station, so he's not going to be around for whilst this video is made. But these two between them are the computer experts of MAPSA. Smile. <laughs> You can continue talking, but this is Mohammed Saduni. He's responsible for being nasty to all our employees. <laughs> now he's responsible for getting me onto a plane, so I'm going to be very, very nice to him. To create the problems. <laughs> <laughs> and then to solve them. It's, called, solve them, yeah. it's called job perpetuation. Yeah. So this is life. That's right. As you can see he's a very, very happy man, also responsible for wearing the brightest shirts in the office. Here we have Paul. He assists, he assists Mohammed Saduni being nasty to people, but generally with a much nicer disposition. So, you know, you don't have to be quite so kind to this particular guy. No, I'm now... Uh, now I'm filming. This is Oscar Biavidi. He's a very good guy because he pays my invoices. Sometimes on time. Sometimes not on time. Always on time. Yeah. 